so neoliberalism is, is a, a, a very tricky uh, concept. Uh, and, and in fact, it's starting to lose its meaning. Joe Clark even calls it a zombie concept in the sense that it's been overused and uh, uh, in many different contexts. And, and we've started to lose sight of, of uh, you know, its implications. So I guess a very um, simple way of approaching uh, neoliberalism is being done by um, Aiwa Ong. And she identifies two different uh, takes on the concept. So the first one is what she calls uh, big N neoliberalism, capital N neoliberalism. And it's kind of a more like post-Marxist approach to it. And, and, and by that, she means uh, th this group of, of um, academics that uh, are understanding neoliberalism as a kind of like economic and political philosophy uh, that is based on the advance, advancement of, um, of some traditional liberal principles. So the idea is how can we uh, re-enact uh, the uses and values of individual freedom and uh, uh, private property and the market and competition. Um, so in that sense, um, um, you could look at uh, neoliberalism and you could go out there and look at how different countries have enacted these principles and in a way rank them and, and ask the question, so which country is more neoliberal than which? Um, and, and in what areas, you know, neoliberalism and all its um, uh, multiple technologies uh, have been developed. Now that's a more traditional way of looking at, at neoliberalism. And, and there is a second and a new wave of, of studies on neoliberalism. And this is what she calls neoliberalism with a small n that focuses on neoliberalism as the governance, the ways of, of um, working with a new type of subject, which is a free subject. This is the way in which governments, but all sort of other uh, types of institutions, devising tools, models, and, and political um, apparatuses or dispositives in order to guide the free decision-making processes of, of a each one of us. Yeah, uh, so, so I think Michel Foucault made a very clear distinction uh, between uh, the, the initial uh, uh, liberal traditions and what we could call nowadays neoliberalism. So according to him, the economies in the 18th and 19th century were based on the principle of exchange. And now with time and, and the evolution of capitalism, that principle that was guiding the way in which we organise societies has been transformed. And uh, it's a new principle that is guiding uh, uh, the way in which we operate nowadays, and that is uh, the principle of competition. So it is that move from exchange into competition that is sort of the, uh, the demarcating line between the two models, if we wanted to put it in a very simple way. And, and, and that's important because it changes the way in which um, actors and, and institutions and people and citizens, each one of us, relate to the system uh, and with the system and, and also relate to each other. Yeah, technology is, is an, a, a higher level of a complexity when we look at the ways in which uh, um, government and institutions um, conduct their activities. Um, so a technology is a more general dimension, a general principle that encompasses a number of multiple tools in order to develop one, one uh, or to push one policy forward. So in that sense, uh, we could think of issues such as individualization or performativity or privatization as general tendencies within you know policy making area that then would take different shapes and, and different formats in different contexts. Yeah I think neoliberalism uh, pretty much touches every single dimension of, of education and, and different aspects of the educational system, the contemporary educational systems nowadays. Let's go back to the uh, our, our initial definition of, of the two types of neoliberalism, the two ways of looking at it. If we were looking at the big end neoliberalism, a very clear example of it would be privatisation. 
would be allowing private entities for profit or not for profit institutions. In this case, it could be businesses or it could be philanthropic organizations or other types of foundations, you know, running and taking control of, of uh, uh, educational institutions. Um, that would be a very good example of a big end neoliberalism um, um, practice. If we go to the second one, which is a bit more subtle, it would be introduced in new ways of understanding and new rationalities about how the political actors relate to each other. And a very clear example in this case would be school choice. Uh, and it's this idea of transforming the role and the relationship between parents and schools. Um, and by uh, allowing parents to choose schools, we transform them into consumers of education. And that situates, you know, change the way in which they relate to the schools, but also the way in which they relate to other parents. So in this case, the parent has become, you know, the guardian for the best future, the best uh, potential uh, for their kids through this very specific technology, choosing the school, the right school for my kid. And in that sense, they're forced to compete with other parents who might be also you know, in, uh, engaged in, in the same activity and, and looking to get the children to the same school. And we all know that school places are, are limited. So the small end neoliberalism would be that change in the way in which we define ourselves as, as political actors at all levels. I guess that the problems with neoliberalism come from also multiple different angles. So teachers tend to uh, feel that the role, both in terms of professionalism, uh, in terms of a salary, in terms of workload, in terms of working conditions, has been changed and modified. And um, um, parents seem to uh, find it as a threat and in not necessarily a direct threat to themselves, but they feel like now they have, they need to assume new roles, more responsibilities. And, and in that sense, it brings a set of anxiety and pressure towards them. Um, and, and in general, collectives feel that they need to engage uh, with the system in a different way. So I guess the main idea is going, bringing it back to this principle of competition that, according to you know, the neoliberal rhetoric, uh, will bring an, an abetterment of the system. But uh, in that sense, it seems to ignore the uh, uh, set of, of uh, problematics that it brings with it. Uh, and, and most of them are related with uh, issues of collectivism, that seems to be lost, um, uh, of, of uh, security, that again seems to uh, be diminished, and also in terms of anxiety, um, given that we are in the constant search for you know, the new best, the new idea, the, the, the new thing that would change the market, would position us as something you know, better than, than the rest of of the uh, competition. I, I guess the, the main point about this is to think of neoliberalism as something that, that is raising a number of questions in terms of how we do things or how we are used to do things. Um, and, and in a way we find uh, some general institutional responses to it. Um, and and also some uh, responses that, that come down to the very personal way in which uh, certain groups of individuals are responding to it. Um, so if we take, for example, uh, the issue of um, um, performance pay for teachers, what we find is that uh, the idea of uh, paying teachers according to the results of their students has, has opened up a big debate in terms of a um, what's the relationship of the teacher as a public servant, you know, with the whole system is. But on the other hand as well, of how are we going to measure the contribution, you know, of, of each one of you know, the teacher's sort of activities to, towards the classroom, towards the, the children's development. Um, and there is a big uh, movement at the moment that try to resist it collectively from the unions. But on the other hand, we've got individual teachers that are struggling with so many of these aspects, you know, uh, by themselves, on their own, in their own classrooms. And they are trying to redefine uh, in, a, in a very personal uh, way, in a very intimate way, uh, how and what 
is it that they do and why is it that they do it? Um, now, this is very linked as well with uh, the, the general trends that we find. And for instance, we know that the UK, or particularly England, uh, suffers from um, um, a big problem of our teacher retention. Um, so uh, I guess that the alternatives are linked to um, the questions that different sectors are, are experimenting. But at the same time, um, with not necessarily a very clear um, answer and model that, that we need to uh, go forward to. Performativity is one of, uh, of what we could call one of the uh, main neoliberal technologies, or policy technologies. Um, so it's this, this belief of the need of constant evaluation and measurement. Um, it's the idea of constantly trying to find evidence to justify and to measure the way in which you know, our activities contribute to the improvement of something. And in education is uh, um, a central uh, aspect of the development of current educational systems. Um, since the 70s and the 80s, we've been looking for new ways and for better ways of measuring the product. And that is a big problem with the problem of performativity. What is the product? Um, how, what is it that we're truly looking at? And multiple governments have uh, given um, different options to this. But if we go back to, to the definition, uh, performativity plays a key role in the enactment or the change of their relationship, well, the relationship of the actors with the system. Um, because once you set up what is it that you want to measure and establish the tools, what you are doing is pretty much redefining that area, that subject. Um, so the teacher that is being measured through the uh, 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 academic results of their students have a new role whatsoever and needs to start planning and planning and thinking and organising his or her activities in a completely different way. So when Stephen wrote this paper, Stephen Ball wrote this paper about the terrors of performativity, what he was trying to reflect on was, was actually on, on that specific um, area. Now that we've got all these sets of evaluations and new ways of relating to the system and new ways of proving uh, um, how we can contribute, how good we are, uh, we are getting into a very unknown place in terms of how we're going to respond to it. And what he's trying to do there is to, to open up a, a space for debate and to sort of understand is this the direction where we're going to go? Is the teacher that becomes the result of this new set of policies that we could call performativity and, 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 and within that we can, we can go from the bottom of, of school league tables all the way up to the ranking of universities, uh, evaluation of research frameworks, uh, teaching, um, uh, multiple teaching, teaching assessment and to the very personal one, performance pay indicators, uh, Ofsted reports and, and, and a way of you know, evaluating each one of, of the dimensions of education and doing it in a way that is quantifiable and that is comparable. So in that way it fosters the competition, it fosters your, your will to do better, to be higher. And it's about trying to do a, a reflection on how is that changing us as lecturers, how is that changing us as teachers, how is that changing us as parents and how is that changing us as students. What, what is it that we are becoming when we engage with this new game of, of performativity. Privatisation and new public management are two key components of, of the, the uh, development of, of what we could call our neoliberal education systems. Um, and then the, the case for privatisation is, is particularly interesting. Um, I think it was Stephen Bull and Deborah Udell who came up with a, a, a differentiation there. So they talked about a more traditional way of understanding privatisation, and that is what we can call the privatisation of education. That is pretty much like opening up the, the delivery of education as a public service um, and to the participation of the private sector. 
And this has been done um, throughout the last three decades in, in more or less intensity by different governments. Um, we've got the uh, pure privatization, so pretty much a selling or giving uh, um, um, state schools to, to private companies, but also some hybrid methods through what we can call public-private partnerships. In that case, in the UK, we've got the examples of the academies and the free schools um, um, model at the moment. In the United States, we've got charter schools. Uh, in, in, in Spain, there is a case for uh, state subsidized public schools run by private institutions. There's a whole range of ways of introducing this sort of form of, of, or, or dimension of privatization of education into the system. Now, they identified a second area, which is what we, they call the privatization in education. And that is like, well, keeping the whole public sector within the public realm in terms of funding, we introduce into the system a new way of organization and running um, the, the service that belongs to, that uh, borrows the model from the private sector. This is a, trying to run schools as we would run a bank or an insurance uh, company or a, a, a mobile telephone business. And it's this idea of introducing a new public management techniques where the role of the head teacher has been reframed, it becomes far more managerial, uh, the teacher becomes more of a technician, there is a different relationship uh, along the lines, and in that sense we've re-adapted and in a way hierarchized the, the uh, uh, organization um, of, of a school, but also of the whole educational system all the way up. But that is a very good question. Uh, and. Uh, I guess we'll need to possibly go back to our original um, uh, definitions of neoliberalism. So if we look at neoliberalism with a capital N, I guess the straightforward answer is that we've had some governments throughout history that have been clearly developing some of these uh, ideas. So uh, we've spoken about uh, Pinochet in Chile, but then we've got Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan. Those are the very traditional examples of you know, the beginnings of, of this new move and this development, de development of capitalism a bit further. Uh, but we've got uh, some neoliberal thinking embedded in, in some more unusual political uh, corners. Uh, uh, the government of Tony Blair developed um, the, this whole idea of performativity further. So they inherited and took it one step further. Um, I still, still think that it was Michael Varbo when he was working uh, for the government uh, that, that created his, his uh, new sort of political mantra called deliberology. And, and it was pretty much based on, on the enactment of these principles. So that would be a traditional way of looking at it within the political spectrum. There are also some international uh, organizations that are doing this at a global scale, like the uh, World Bank or the International uh, Monetary Fund, or a number of uh, global uh, foundations that are developing all these principles. So, Partly, I mean, we've been conducting some research in different parts of the world, and we can see these actors like mushrooming uh, constantly uh, in places like India, uh, all the way down to South Africa, uh, Liberia, uh, and, and, and South America, like uh, Argentina or Brazil. So that would be a, a way of looking at it. This, trying to look at corporate and institutional actors within the political spectrum that do it. But if we focus on the smaller neoliberalism, then we should say that we all are, that we all engage uh, with it. And, and this is partly through our participation in, in everyday activities. So in a sense, uh, when we speak about neoliberalism, I, 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 I like to say that neoliberalism has gotten to our kitchens. And it's pretty much uh, uh, touching every single intimate um, area of our everyday lives. So we compete for things now that we didn't in the past. And it's that logic of competition that is sort of uh, 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 filtering down. Um, I tend to use the example of, of, um, of a few uh, television programs where we compete for baking the best cake, dancing uh, the best song or singing the best song, uh, but also the dating um, well. And, and now we can quantify um, the level of match that we might get with a potential um, 
individual that we might get to meet in the future through a specific, a specific site. So it's through the engagement with these multiple areas, these sites, that neoliberalism gets enacted by each one of us in our everyday lives. Um, if we, if we are parents and are choosing education for our kids, if we are teachers and, and we are redefining our relationship with our colleagues uh, in terms of getting a better performance for, for my kids and my classroom against others, if we are head teachers that are in the constant hand for the next Ofsted inspection uh, or uh, how are the other uh, schools in the area doing and how do they compare to, to my school. Um, in, there are a myriad of ways in which we all um, um, uh, personally and intimately relate to, to neoliberalism. Uh, so no one's safe. Neoliberalism affects more countries than others. And, and historically, we can always point out uh, um, uh, some of the very traditional examples. So I guess the, um, the prime example of you know, neoliberal experiment is Chile. Uh, and all, all the um, reforms that, that uh, the dictatorship of, of, of Pinochet brought about with the support, and this is important to mention, of this uh, group of intellectuals from the Chicago School. So there was a moment of, of political experimentation, um, uh, which is very controversial within the, uh, the Pinochet dictatorship. Uh, but there are other cases. I, uh, England um, is, is a very uh, clear and good example. Uh, uh, New Zealand and Australia and, and the United States. And they all, they all have played and developed uh, different areas and different aspects more than others. Now, what we can see nowadays is how neoliberalism has been pushed and it's been uh, heavily um, um, supported by a number of international organizations. Some of them are very traditional, so we know that the World Bank has been pushing through um, multiple sources uh, for the de development, for the enactment, for the embracement of uh, some neoliberal policies in different contexts, and, and some um, are more hidden. Uh, and there are now a group of, of neoliberal uh, philanthropic organizations that are also pushing through that charitable um, activities and that charitable door, uh, these new um, neoliberal tendencies. The important thing with neoliberalism is that it doesn't necessarily take an unitarian shape. And someone's descript, they described it as a chameleon. It kind of seems to sit outside the borders and, and observes the context and then finds a way of, of entering, of getting through, of you know, cannibalizing it. Um, so it takes different shapes in different uh, countries. Uh, and that's uh, kind of a response to those that think that we could possibly identify and set in a table which countries are more neoliberal than others. I guess the question here is uh, what aspects, what areas of this specific uh, educational system has been transformed within the logic, the, the philosophical principle of neoliberalism that we explained before. And in that sense, I, I believe that we could find a little bit or a lot of neoliberalism in each country, in each region, in each uh, um, um, uh, municipality or in each neighbourhood. Well, the future is always um, uh, unpredictable. Uh, and in a way, I, I, I'm going to borrow here uh, uh, Michel Foucault's uh, words when, when he suggests, he, he, uh, he was asked this question uh, at some point uh, about something different, about his own work. And he, he said, uh, um, um, do you think that if I knew what the conclusions of the book were going to be before I started writing it, I would have the courage to end up writing the book? Um, so I guess what, what neoliberalism has done is create a number of areas, signal a number of areas that have brought some issues into question. Now, as we, as we said before, there are a number of institutions that are pushing for the development at the global scale, uh, scale and at a very rapid pace of all these uh, uh, new dynamics. But as, as, as we know, uh, power is, is usually measured by uh, the, the, the strength of the dynamics of resistance that it generates. It, it, couldn't, it couldn't leave, it couldn't exist without that, those resisting dynamics at the same time. And uh, what we can see at the moment is like a big um, 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 sort of like push and the creation of new movement and creative solutions to neoliberalism. 
So what we could possibly uh, expect for the future is sort of an intensification of the conflict. Uh, and, and also answers uh, that would come from a wide range of the political spectrum. So we've got the rise of populism that in a way is not, or could be seen, not simply, but could be seen also as, as a reaction to it, to, to what we could call is an, an extreme version of neoliberalism that is not working um, for, for, for society as a, as a whole complex. Um, we've got, on the other hand, you know, a, a kind of like a re uh, thinking of more traditional socialist uh, um, um, uh, principles. And uh, we've gone back to, and, and some collectives have seen their roles uh, re-energised, like some unions at a very local level. The important thing here is to also think that neoliberalism has never been a static concept, so it's been in constant evolution. And in that sense, it keeps evolving as you know it faces new questions and new resistances. So in a way, it's not going to disappear, it's going to evolve and it's going to ch possibly change and adapt to, to times and, and the difficulties.